everybody, and welcome to Unapologetic. I'm your host, Amla Fanobi. We have Taylor in the producer's bay. Hello. And today we have a very, very special guest. You know, I rarely give two varies when I talk about the guests <laughs> we have on this show, but today it's very, very. <laughs> You guys know I used to be a very radical leftist, and I ended up waking up by going on the internet and searching up different points of views, not really to open my mind, but to reinforce the ideas that I already had. Little did I know I was going to stumble upon a man by the name of Larry Elder. Larry, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. How am I, I going to live up to that introduction? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have a feeling you will have no trouble living up to it. Now... Uh, so many of the videos that I found that you, that you were making at the time or that people were filming of you speaking was you debunking systemic racism. You've really made uh, a career in part by going after people who choose to run with these myths and really hold down black America with them. What made you decide, I'm going to go after this narrative? I don't think there was any moment, there was any epiphany. I've just always been like that. Mm -hmm. I grew up in the 60s and I was, had a lot of friends who had a lot of views that were emotionally held. Uh, not were not very well thought out, and I'd ask a few questions, and all of a sudden, I'm an Uncle Tom, I'm a sellout. Mm -hmm. I've been that way all my life. I was called that when I was in college. I was called that when I was in law school. My, my dad was literally homeless at the age of 13. Uh, Jim Crow South, at the beginning of the Great Depression, uh, never met his biological father. Mm -hmm. And fast forward, my dad ended up starting a small cafe in the Pico Union area of L.A. I know you're new to L.A., but it's a heavily Hispanic area. And he ended up buying the property beneath the restaurant, a little pizza property next door, plus the house that we have in South Central. So my dad died at the age of 95 years old. This this eighth grade dropout was a little short of net worth $1 million. Mm. And my dad was a strong patriot. He was a World War II veteran, believed very much in, in American values, even though growing up in the South, he knew that America wasn't realizing those values. Uh, he was a, a Christian. He believed in hard work uh, and he believed in um, entrepreneurship. And he taught all of us, if you work hard, apply yourself, Compared to how I was raised, he would say, the door is wide open. So I've always had that philosophy. Mm -hmm. And I can't say it was political until I got a little older and then began realizing I was a small L libertarian. I discovered people like Thomas Sowell uh, and Walter Williams. I began reading all their stuff. Uh, and uh, that's pretty much my orientation. But there was never any, any you know, big bang moment where I said, oh my God, I, I'm this, I'm that. Right. I've always been somebody who believed in myself. My mother uh, emphasized education. And I remember when I was seven years old, um, my mom sat, sits me down and we had a little thin book of all the presidents from George Washington to the then incumbent Dwight Eisenhower. Went over all their highlights and lowlights. Mm. And when, when my mom finished all the presidents, she said, she tapped the book, she said, Larry, someday you could be in here if you want. Now I never aspired to politics, despite the fact that I ran for governor, which we can talk to later, talk about later on. But I always knew that whatever I wanted to do, I would be able to do it. My mom believed in me, she believed in the country. And so that's always been my orientation. Mm. And then I began to get into radio and television and interview people, many of whom had this attitude that America was systemically racist. Uh, and as you know, the Dave Rubin uh, was kind of my coming out party for a lot of young people like you. And the backstory is this. I didn't know who he was. And one of my younger friends suggested I go on his uh, podcast. Mm. And I did. And I, he, at the time he did it out here in L.A. And he's hooking everything up, setting everything up. And I said to him, I understand that you're, that you're a liberal. He said, yeah, I would call myself that. And I said, well, you won't be when I'm done with you. And I wasn't trying to be cocky, Amala. I just knew that if he was rational and sane, and I could tell by talking to him, he was. If you're rational and sane, mm -hmm. and you really want the truth, and I could tell he wanted the truth, once you are disabused of some of your bad ideas, you have no choice but to rethink them. Right. And by the time the interview was over, he wasn't the same guy. Mm. And what we're going to do today is actually take a look at one of the key points in that interview that really changed a lot of people's minds and really woke some people up. I'm going to get us plugged in here. And we're going <laughs> to show a clip of Dave where he doesn't look so great that everyone's yes. seen already. I'm so sorry to do this to you, but <laughs> I have this just tremendous opportunity yes, because yes. both Dave Rubin and Larry Elder are in studio, so I couldn't have them both here without reacting to this video. And it's a video that you've never been able to run away from as long as you live. <laughs> <laughs> Very few people have been able to wake up from their psychosis through a video that they themselves did, and right. then it will be shown again and again I'm so and sorry. again. <laughs> All right, just throw to it. Here we go, guys. So, but you wouldn't not acknowledge that there are some systemic issues. Give, give me an example. 
Get, tell me what you think the most systemic racist issue is. What is it? Well, I would say that because black people in most cases, in many cases, were descendants of slaves, that racism as a as an institution, that it just, a certain amount of it just exists. In 2015? I, it, that it, give, give me the most blatant racist example you can come up with right now. What's uh, going through your head in this moment? Did you expect uh, him to even like breach this subject matter, to go at you like this? Well, first off, can we acknowledge one thing, which is that I'm aging pretty well. <laughs> I'm aging pretty well. You you, you're aging like started, fine wine, thank actually. You, thank you. Started taking better. You know, that's one of the things. As you wake up out of leftism, you start huh. taking a little more personal responsibility. Right. Hit the gym a little bit more. You're eat like, a little bit better. Beauty is a thing. We're getting there. Yeah, um, yeah. I was also look very tired there because it's <laughs> exhausting being a leftist. It really is to constantly have to rationalize the world. Um, I knew once he responded that way that mm -hmm. I was in trouble. I, I really? absolutely, I do remember that. I knew I was in trouble and I actually was a little, um, I was almost impressed that he went at me the way he did because it usually doesn't happen in interviews. And mm. I think he, you know, I should have been more prepared. Mm. Maybe there was no way to be prepared because I wouldn't have sure. had reality on my side. But mm -hmm. uh, but then from there, it just got snowballed. Worse. Yeah. yeah. And I had many moments like this, like, guys, and I, I love this because you decided to put the video out like this yeah. was your decision. You could have cut that out and been like, here's an interview with Larry Elder. I, I talk about in Don't Burn This Book that I actually think that this is the best and worst moment of my career at the exact same time, hmm. because when we finished this, it was not live streamed. It was live to tape. It was going up the next day and all the producers came up to me and were like, don't worry, Dave, we're going to get rid of that. We're going to edit it, whatever. And I just, you know, sometimes you just say something and you don't even know exactly why you say it. And mm -hmm. I was like, no, if I'm an interviewer, if this is what I do, well, then how am I going to edit out the, basically the realest moment that has ever happened right. to me on camera? Mm -hmm. And I can assure you that the next day when the clip started going viral and then it was clipped a zillion way, black conservative destroys white oh, libtard. Gosh, and when you're, yeah. with, when you're that white libtard, it's not that fun. No. But over a day or two, as I saw the comments rolling in and people were kind of like, you know, Ruben kind of took the hit and he mm -hmm. listened and whatever. Then I realized, boy, there's maybe an opportunity here to think about things a little bit differently. And then here we are. Right. You did not shut down. It keeps going. There's more. Thanks. <laughs> um, I think you could probably find evidence that in general, cops are that, that cops are more willing to shoot if the uh, perpetrator is black What's your data than for, white. What's your basis for saying that? L last year- the, Well, look, I know a lot of people would say, look what's going on in Chicago. I, I, I know what they would say. Yeah. I'm talking about what the facts are. 965 people were shot by cops last, uh, last year and killed. 4% of them were white cops shooting unarmed blacks. In, in Chicago in 2011, 21 people were shot and killed by cops. Uh, in 2015, there were seven. Uh, in Chicago, which is a third black, a third white, and a third Hispanic, 70% of the homicides are black on black. Uh, about 40 per month, almost 500 uh, in the year, per year, last year in Chicago, and 75% of them are unsolved. Where is the Black Lives Matter on that? The idea that a racist white cop uh, shooting unarmed black people is a peril to black people is BS. It's yeah. complete and total BS. And, and the reason for these so-called activists saying this is the assumption that racism remains a major problem in America. The media, CNN, especially MSNBC, runs down whenever a black cop shoots somebody uh, and, it, and it's a, some, some march on Washington. It's ridiculous. Uh, black people, half the homicides in this country are committed by and against black people. Last year, there were 14,000 homicides, not talking about suicides, I'm talking about homicides. Mm -hmm. um, half of them were black, 96% of them black on black of that 7,000. Where's a black... Black Lives Matter people on that. So that, there's where you would say that this is purely because of social justice. Pause there. I, 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 did, I did make a mistake when I said, uh, whenever a black cop shoots somebody, I'm in a white cop. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, you, can, you can hear that moment, but with all the facts that you're right. spitting out, you're bound to make a mistake. Where does all this information come from? Uh, just uh, studying, and uh -huh. I, I can remember things that are important to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't tell you what I had for dinner last night. If I went to a nice restaurant, I couldn't tell you how to get there. Mm. But you give me a stat or a fact that's important, uh, and I will remember it. Uh, in, on April 27, 2016, in the Washington Post, there was a very long article about the allegation that cops are engaging in systemic racism against black people. They talked about studies going back over decades, showing if anything, the cops are more hesitant, more reluctant to use deadly force against a black suspect than a white suspect. The same year in July 2016, there was a front page article in the New York Times about a Harvard economist named Roland Fryer. He is so brilliant. He's the youngest tenured professor in the history of Harvard. And Harvard is the oldest college in America. That's how sharp this guy is. And he's from Baltimore. 
he just knew that the police were mowing down black people just because they were black. Mm -hmm. And he found out there hadn't been a study to confirm it. So he thought he would do one. And he got the conclusions. They were the opposite of what he thought. He got rid of all his staffers, hired a new set of staffers. Same conclusion. Again, the cops were more hesitant, more reluctant to pull the trigger on a black suspect than a white suspect. Mm -hmm. And he said, and I'm paraphrasing, it was the most, most surprising finding of my professional career, end of quote. There's a city here in L.A. called Rialto. It's about 100,000. And demographically, it represents the demographic breakdown of California. It's roughly 40% Hispanic, as is California, 30% white, as is California, the rest black and, and Asian American. And the cops were ordered to wear body cams for a year. And they didn't want to, uh, but they did. Fast forward, what were the results? Police complaints fell 90%. Hmm. Police use of force fell 50%. Not because the cops behaved any differently. They behaved as they were trained to behave. People stopped lying. Mm. They knew that they were being filmed. And if you file a false complaint against a police officer, that's a crime. And they stopped resisting because they were being filmed. So the police didn't have to use force the way they had to before. It shows you how many people are flat out lying the way Michael Brown did. Yeah. Not Michael Brown, but Dorian Johnson, his friend, who said he had his hands up, said, don't shoot. Turned out to be a complete lie. His DNA was found on the officer's gun, showing that Michael Brown was trying to get the officer's gun. And so many of these allegations against the police are just flat out lies. That's why so many people believe that such systemic racism, because they take it first at face value, a lot of things that people say when in fact they're lying. Mm. And it's interesting because when you are subscribed to a narrative like that and you just believe I'm a victim, regardless of what anybody says, that's what you'll do. You'll just lie. You'll find a way to fit it into your worldview and make right. it work. And, and Amal, it's, it's not just that it's wrong. It has real world consequences. Mm -hmm. If you're a cop, especially a white cop, uh, and you see something suspicious, you know, you much of police work is discretionary. Uh, you can respond and to, to, to radio calls or you can get out of your car and try to stop stuff before it happens. If you are proactive, you're going to have more interactions with, with people and increasing the chances that you're going to be accused of, of, doing, of, of wrongdoing. So a lot of cops are simply being passive. It's called the Ferguson effect or the George mm -hmm. Floyd effect. And arrests are down in many cities, even though crime is up, robberies are up, uh, homicides are up, shootings are up, but arrests are down. Why? Cops aren't being proactive anymore. What's the upside? You're a white cop. Why should I get out of my car and try and stop something? Someone's going to take a, a video of it. They won't start it when, it's, when, it, uh, when it really started, so right. it won't, won't be in context. I could lose my job. I could lose my pension. I could be accused of a crime. I could go to jail. To hell with it. So people are pulling back, and the ones who are hurt the most are people living in the inner city because that's where the crime is. Yep, and you're absolutely right. And I tell you guys all the time on the show, I've done a lot of work with LAPD out here in Watts, and the, the police officers are handcuffed basically doing their jobs, and they don't feel like, I want to go out and be proactive about this. I don't want to go and, and help people if it's going to come um, at the risk right. of me losing my own livelihood. Right. Now, and, and meanwhile, Amala, the people living in the inner city, they want more cops. They want yikes. the manpower to be at least the same, if not higher. Yep. So normal people, not Black Lives Matter activists, not loudmouths like Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton, normal people who get up and go to work every day, pay their taxes, trying to do the right thing, they want more protection. They're the ones who are being hurt. Yep. But they're the ones that people on the left claim that they care about. Every single time. Every single time. Now, what I love about this video, Larry, uh, in this moment with Dave, is that you don't let it go. You know, he made an assertion and you said, I'm going to hold you to it. We're going to skip ahead a little bit and have you talk to him about that. In Baltimore, where Freddie Gray was killed, uh, Freddie Gray died in a van. I shouldn't say was killed, died in a van. Yeah. You have a city that's 45% uh, black. Uh, city council is 100% Democrat. The majority of city council is black. The top cop at the time was, was black. The number two cop was black. The majority of the command staff is black. The, the mayor is black. Uh, the AG is black. Uh, and yet here we are talking about racism. I mean, it's, it's absurd. Yeah. It's absurd. So it's funny. I find myself caught in between this a little bit as a liberal where I want to always try to defend the other. So in this case, the other being black people, I, I'm always sympathetic to that. And that, uh, yeah, yeah, at the same time, I hear you laying out a pretty solid well, case. Well, you know, it's so interesting because watching this, even though I've seen it a million times, what's mm -hmm. hitting me is you can see, like, I don't really know what I'm saying, but I have this general idea that there's this racist thing that has just permeated everything. But also what you can see is that it's not coming from a horrible place from from mm -hmm. me. You know, it's sort of like, oh, that we should care about these sort of things. Then he just lays it out. And Larry lays it out basically better than anybody because he's a fact machine. Yeah. You know, he's just he's just an absolute computer when it comes to this stuff. And 
I just had nothing. Man, I remember watching this and just not wanting to believe Larry Elder so hard. Yeah. Just being like, he's being rude. Look at him. He's right. just attacking this guy. And like, I don't want to believe a word he said. None of it's true. And then eventually you just go down this <laughs> rabbit hole of like, oh, holy shit. Everything yeah. he said is absolutely true. But I was so on your side watching this. Like, I was trying to come up with answers to the questions that he was giving. Well, I think that's why this clip, which is now being clipped 400 gajillion times. Yes. And everything, I think that's why it really took off with people because it shows that even though we can make fun of the lefties all the time, and believe me, they are well worth making fun of usually, that there is a percentage of them, I would say, that are just not thinking clearly about the issues. Mm -hmm. And if you do what Larry did, and you state your your case clearly, which is now what I do from a different perspective, right. that you can hopefully get these people. So I think that's why it worked, because people never see that in real time anymore. What you see on you know, any debate show now is just like an endless destruction of people, not like mm -hmm. an actual oh, here's something I think, here's something I think, like, let's do it and then see where the chips fall. Right. Nobody's ready to have those conversations anymore. And this is one of the just rare moments where it's happened. And again, kudos to you for actually putting it out there for people to see. You know, what can I tell you? I'm pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> let's keep watching. Oh, more? Yeah. What? Yeah. Just a fact. I'll tell you something else, too. There was just a study, um, uh, University of Washington. Uh, and it turns out cops were more reluctant, more hesitant to pull the trigger against a black, black suspect than a white suspect, uh, probably because of the fear of being accused of racially profiling and the fear that the civil rights establishment was going to come down on them. So if anything, uh, whites are more likely to be shot by a cop under, under certain circumstances than a, than, a, uh, than a black person. And in the last 30 or 40 years, the number of percentage of suspects killed by cops who are black has declined 75 percent however the percentage of whites killed by cops has flatlined yeah and so if anything people are more concerned about shooting black people for fear that they're going to be called racist and almost all every one of these incidents whether it's eric gardner in in new york who died because he was selling lucy's and re resisted arrest whether it's tamir rice in cleveland who was twirling around the gun whether it's michael brown in ferguson uh who had just uh committed an ar strong arm robbery almost every one of these incidents involves somebody resisting arrest. Why don't you just do what the police tell you? My dad said, when I get pulled over, have my hand at 10 o'clock, have my hand at two o'clock, say yes, sir, say no, sir, make sure my paperwork is in, in order. And if I feel the cop is uh, mistreating me, get a badge number and deal with it later on. If Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton and Obama and the whole group of them told black people to do that, we'd have a lot fewer of these things uh, to deal with in the first place. Yeah. All right, so I'm, I'm with you. I, I'm hearing a lot of what you're saying here. So as a black conservative then, who now you've, you've laid out your case there. But you haven't laid out yours. I, so, asked, I asked you to name the most important uh, example of racism and you gave white cops going after black people. And I, and I told you, gave you the facts for that. So that's nonsense. So what, you must have something else. What else is it? <laughs> Uh, so when we, we talked to Dave about this, Dave said, as soon as we got into the subject matter and Larry started going at me, I went, oh no, I am not ready for this. <laughs> <laughs> and he knew he wasn't prepared. So what, what about this made you go, no, wait a second. I want you to go back to what you said earlier. Because um, I think I mentioned this. I thought of him as a sane, rational mm -hmm. person. We chatted a little bit before the interview and I said, this is a common sense guy. Mm -hmm. He is just ill-informed, mm -hmm. undereducated. And once he gets the facts, he's going to rethink his assumptions. So I wanted to make sure that I that I brought it back to the, what we're talking about. If you think racism well, remains a problem in America, give it to well, me. Well, I think it remains a problem. Give it it's to me. Not, it's give it not, to me. It may not be systemic in that we have. It's not like you're not being hired because you're black. There's no systemic reason, you know, legal reason that that exists, that kind of thing. But I think that racism, as a general uh, I need some, theory, I need exists. some. I need some specifics. You gave me the white cop thing. What else? Give me another example where you think is a problem. Well, well, uh, as a black conservative, tell me how do no, no, you, you how do you, you get people to you're, come around? You're, you're the one who yeah. made the assertion that you yeah. think racism remains a major problem in America. I asked you to give me an example. You gave me white cops going after blacks. I, as, as far as I'm concerned, you didn't hold it up very well. What's the other argument you have? How did you leave this interview? Did you leave this interview being like, I just got attacked by Larry Elder? Did you guys leave buddies? Was it no, friends? I knew I screwed up. Mm. I knew it, which is why I was able to go into the control room and then do the right thing mm -hmm. because I just. It really, I said it before, but it really hit me. Like, if this is what I do for a living, mm -hmm. if I cut the thing that's the most real and the most important, then there's just no point in me doing this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to Larry's credit, even, you know, 
it's not that he's defensive there, but it sounds a little defensive because he's just giving you stats, yep. giving you stats. And it sounds like he's on the attack. But also when you've been on the right side of things for so long and been treated so horribly for it, which he has for decades been fighting this fight and been treated horribly for it, um, I, you know, it, it becomes hard to do, mm -hmm. but he still does it well. And really the beauty of all of this is that who would have thought that I think this was in maybe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, this was... I think February of 2016, who would have thought that five or six years later, I would be opening for him on these tour stops right. and that we'd be on the same side fighting for the same things. It's, mm -hmm. it's actually pretty beautiful. It is astounding. And like from my perspective, sitting and watching this when, you know, it was going viral and, and coming to terms with my own, you know, transition into a different sort of maybe ideology or a different set of ideas. And now sitting with the both of you and <laughs> yeah. talking about this blows my mind. So this video is probably going to live far beyond the moment it was posted, which is good and bad for you, but mainly good, I think. Thank you once again for bringing it up. And I can't help it. I really, really can't help it. Um, but I, it's so exciting, and I think we're going to introduce so many people to, to this moment and to you and Larry and watching this and just being open to ideas because sometimes we all come to the table and we're not always right. And and to now I assume we're going to show the uh, when I was in second grade in the play when I was the tooth <laughs> and I was the lower incisor and I fell off the stage. You got that one too? Yes. I think that's up there. Here's Libtard just, falls off stage. Or, here's a straight up blooper reel of Dave Rubin's <laughs> entire life uh, given to him by uh, his mother. He's, she sent this over to us. Um, no, there's no more that we will subject oh. you to. <laughs> but Dave, thank you for reacting to this video and letting people know the behind the scenes. Thank you for bringing me in to humiliate me. <laughs> Anytime. We asked Dave, you know, you could have both left this moment and been like, oh, I'm never going to talk to that man mm -hmm. again. I, I've been embarrassed or, or I've, I feel attacked. But you guys are very good friends now. We are. How do you think uh, others can navigate conversations like that and leave with the result that you left with? Well, I think the important thing is, and this may sound immodest, is that I was calm. Mm -hmm. I wasn't angry. I wasn't defensive. Mm -hmm. And to his credit, it wasn't a live show. It's mm -hmm. a show like, like this one. Mm -hmm. And Dave could have taken it out. He could have not played it. It embarrassed him. Yep. And to his credit, not only did he not do it, he played it and then reacted to it and admitted that I changed his mind. A lot of people wouldn't have done that. Yep. And that's what I try and do. I always tried when I was on radio to be entertaining. If you're not entertaining, forget about it. No one's going to sure. care. Sure. To be informative, uh, to be provocative, mm -hmm. and to uplift. And every now and then I'm able to do all four. It's amazing, amazing. <laughs> and I, I don't, don't want to end this video without mentioning that you have a project, Uncle Tom 2, that is just... Uh, completely uh, a, a marker for, for young black Americans and just Americans in general to watch and sort of dispel a lot of these myths about systemic racism, how Marxism is infused in those ideas. That's sort of the premise of the documentary. Can you tell people a little bit about that and where they can find it? They can find it on UncleTom.com. Mm -hmm. And it's the sequel to my first documentary, Uncle Tom 1, where I talked about the post-slavery experience of blacks. Mm -hmm. And even though there was Jim Crow, even though there were lynchings, even though there were the KKK, Black people still kept moving forward, Amala. 1940, 87% of blacks were below the poverty line. Uh, 20 years later, that number had fallen to 47 points. Mm -hmm. That's a 40 point drop in 20 years. The greatest 20 year period of economic expansion in the history of black America. That was before the Civil Rights Act of 64, 65, voting the Open Housing Act. Most of it was before Brown versus Board of Education. Why? Strong families. It was unusual for a black kid to be raised without a father in the house. Belief in God, a belief in, in patriotism uh, and a belief in entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. They kept moving forward. Now fast forward, Uncle Tom too talks about organizations like Black Lives Matter, whose co-founders are self-described trained Marxists. Yep. Marx was an atheist, didn't believe in God, didn't believe in religion, didn't believe in capitalism, let alone entrepreneurship. Uh, and on their website, they attack the nuclear intact family as some sort of European construct. And now 70% of black people enter the world without a father married to the mother. And what we've done because of the so-called war on poverty, which was started in the mid-60s, is to incentivize women to marry the government and incentivize men to abandon their financial and moral responsibility. Mm -hmm. The number one problem facing black America is not systemic racism, not the need for critical race theory, not the need for set-asides. It is the large number of kids who enter the world without a father married to the mother. And forget about elder because I'm conservative and I'm an Uncle Tom. I was called <laughs> the black face of white supremacy, by the way, yes. when I ran for governor. Yes. Barack Obama whose first book was called Dreams from My Father, was all about the angst that he felt because he grew up without his biological father, 
whom he last saw when he was 10 years old, mm. about all the pain he had. And Barack Obama once said, a kid raised without a father is five times more likely to be poor and commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of school, and 20 times more likely to end up in jail. So Uncle Tom, too, talks about what happened to the civil rights movement, infiltrated by leftists, by Democrats, by socialists, by collectivists, by Marxists, to turn it from a valid quest for equal rights into an invalid quest for equal results. I don't know if you guys just felt like you watched the movie sitting right here. <laughs> but seriously, go to UncleTom.com and actually watch the movie in its entirety because to see it all laid out in front of you, it's almost... It's, you. A, it's a powerful mo movie. Really? And if you go on IMDb and just read the reviews, yep. uh, I, I couldn't have written better reviews than that. Guys, if you like this video, please like, subscribe, click the notification bell to be notified every single time we post a new video for you guys. And you can check out Dave where? RubenReport.locals.com <laughs> And he will never be on this program ever again. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, guys. Do you guys like that video? I did. <laughs> Please like, subscribe, click the notification bell to be notified every single time we post a new video for you guys because I'm sure you wouldn't want to miss it, would ya? And if you want exclusive emails sent to you directly from me, you can subscribe to my email list down below. You'll also be the first one to know when we come out with any new merch. Uh, you'll get our Discord link, which you can go and join to talk to your fellow Amala community members. And uh, you guys can pick guests for the show, topics that we're going to talk about, and just have an open line of communication in case we get censored, which could happen at any moment. You know that they hate what we have to say sometimes. So again, that link is in the description down below, and all I need is your email if you'd like to give it to me. Hope you guys have a fantastic day. See ya.